It's Zach Eady with the Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back to Boilers in the Stands. I am your host, Joe Jackson. Joining me is my co-host, Craig Bowers. We do have Greg Braggs on site in Mackey Arena for the first time this year. He's going to be doing some of the post-game stuff, so definitely check us out on Twitter at Boilers and Stands for some of the press, post-game presser and things like that. Purdue knocks off Eastern Kentucky 80-53, to their last non-conference regular season game of the year, their last bye game of the year. Um, it is Big Ten play going forward, starting with Maryland on Tuesday. Uh, we will probably preview a bit of Maryland and maybe just the Big Ten in general as we get later into the show. We'll spend the first you know, 20, 25 minutes. That's what we say, 20, 25 minutes uh, talking about Eastern Kentucky. It might go way longer. Um, here at Mackey Arena, still a pretty big crowd, honestly, waiting for, for Zach Eady signatures especially. But uh, really anybody that any of the players that are willing to come out, sign stuff, uh, I expect if Eady's going through everybody tonight, it, it's going to be a, a very long night. Uh, just Good things to see, though, as Purdue gets another 27-point victory over Eastern Kentucky. Um, obviously not the uh, – there's there's Craig for uh, kind of showing the the crowd that's still here. I mean, half of the lower bowl is pretty full still, or, or 40% of it, I would say. Um, just shows, one, that, like, how much this team, I think, means to people, uh, that, that they're willing to stay this long. And also just – it goes back to Edie and the other players being willing to actually do like just stay out here, sign everything. Um, it's it's not something you see all the time. So uh, I did my best. Greg Bragg's intro kind of rambling here. I'll throw it to you, Craig. Anything from you know this game, uh, you know what's going on right now, stuff like that, that you just kind of want to want to throw out there. I, I mean, this is nuts. Um, this is I, I've like- been coming. I've been coming to Purdue games for a long, long time. And for those of you guys that have, I maybe in the Glenn Robinson days, uh, I, I've never seen anything like this just after a game. It, it looks it looks like a line at the, you know, like family day that they have or whatever when everybody comes around. There's got to be at least almost 20% of the people who are in Mackey are still in here waiting. Zach's out signing autographs. Lance Jones is out signing autographs. Uh, just really an, an incredible, incredible scene all the way around. So I, I got to say that first and just um, kudos to Zach uh, for creating this environment where people think they'll be able to get one. I will say that if, if he stays and does this um, until he's finished, he may be here until 11 o'clock tonight just trying to get through everybody because it, it is just a massive amount of fans. And this is, you know, usually one of those games. I've, I've got quite a few friends here tonight who brought their entire family. Uh, these are those games they usually tend to when the students are away. They're usually buy games. They're a little bit cheaper, so maybe they can afford to buy five, six, or seven tickets when uh, other times maybe they won't. Um, so there are a lot of people in here who probably don't come uh, to a lot of the other games tonight. So it'll be real interesting to see how long these guys stay out here and sign autographs tonight. Yeah, for sure. It's going to be a minute. Uh, Sasha Stefanovic has got a little bit of a cheer, I think, as he came out. Um, was not doing my good good job producing there. Left you on solo. Um, but, yeah, we can, we'll talk about the game a bit. Like this, the, quickly to add on, it just is crazy. It, it really is crazy how many people are here. Um, like you said, it's because of Zach Eady and, and the environment he's created being dominant but still just willing to to spend time with everybody that shows up and supports so uh, we can actually get into a little bit of a breakdown of the game purdue wins 80 to 53 over eastern kentucky um a game that you know it's their first game in eight days and i i would think the first five minutes especially kind of showed that uh, this has been kind of what purdue has done the last couple of bye games it's felt like a little bit of a slow start or at least the last one um for sure against jacksonville but a little bit of a slow start get things going towards the end of the first half, dominate the beginning of the second half, and then um, from there just just kind of coast. 
where do we want to start? Do we want to start with the player? Was there anything big picture um, from this game? I know it's, there's not too much to take away, but anything like really stand out from pure on court performance for you? You know, this is uh, early on in the season. There was several different times where we were like, man, we usually talk about the rebound margin right off the back as like one of the huge keys. And this is one of those games where you really can. I think the rebound margin was ended up 46 to 25, but in reality, I think that was bigger until uh, some of the main players kind of went out and went to the bench. And I also thought it was real interesting kind of where that came from. Um, TKR continued to be really, really active on the boards, especially early. Um, he got six, he finishes with six rebounds, but I think he had five in, in like that first stint of five or six minutes that he played. Um, extremely active. And then Gillis came in at the same spot playing at the four and was also really active. He finishes with nine rebounds. Edie finishes with seven. Uh, so he doesn't quite get to a double double. But um, I thought I thought they were really active on the boards. And, and sometimes this year, earlier in the year, where I thought maybe they weren't as dominant rebounding as what they had been last year and what they could be. Um, I think both people in the four spot have really stepped up in the last few games to help reassert some of that dominance from a rebounding standpoint. So I, there's a lot of other things to point to, obviously, but that was one that just jumped out as huge to me right off the back. Yeah, no, I think uh, especially TKR, like you said, I think he had really good energy to start the game. And we're seeing that more and more consistently, I feel like uh, it's going to be like seems like Painter's sticking with TKR 80. I think we're starting to get a little bit of the results that. Um, maybe we were hoping for kind of to come into the year. He's starting to adjust. It's starting to just look better in general. Obviously, this isn't the toughest opponent, so we got to see it against Big Ten teams and that, but they'll have the opportunity to do that. I think for me, the biggest just kind of takeaway is is pretty much the balanced scoring. Um, you have seven guys score at least seven points. Uh, I think 11 different players scored today, four in double figures. Fletcher leads the way with 14, but Edie has 13, TKR has 10, Gillis has 10, um, and then both Smith and Heidi end up with seven. It's not the full 10-person depth, I think, that we were expecting coming into the season, but this was a little bit more of the, hey, Purdue's just got a bunch of dudes that can do it. Um, I, You know, Fletcher Laurie hit a couple big shots. Brayden really wasn't hunting his shot. He just kind of took it if it was there. Jones a couple times, and you pointed out, too, during the game, it's just he kind of realizes, like, oh, I can just get to the rim whenever I want. Um, Edie, uh, Edie scores three points in the first half, 10 in the second half, and uh, somebody – during halftime, Bragg's kind of was like, hey, is Edie not going to get to double digits? Me and Craig were like, no, he's just going to get it. Second half is what he does. <laughs> I said he'd get it in five minutes in the second half. Uh, and Craig said in four minutes he would get it in the second half. And what would you know? At exactly four minutes, Edie gets double figures for the game. Uh, just had to, had to shout that out because Craig called that exactly on the dot. On the dot. On the dot. So, but yeah, just balanced score. I mean, Gillis hits a couple threes. His only miss from three is just that out second heave or whatever the shot clock um just good to see a bunch of guys being able to score being able to contribute and really the last tune-up game before you get into big 10 play where yes the big 10 is down um but they're you know there's nobody that was like that's like minnesota bad last year right this is going to be a year that even you know penn state maryland iowa whoever you kind of want to throw at the bottom um, on any given night they can give you a run so uh just good to see everybody contribute and just maybe get some confidence going heading into Big Ten play. Yeah, and I, I thought the other thing, too, I, I mean, it was obviously that they they looked a little rusty. They looked a little sloppy coming out of Christmas break. It, it, it's to be expected. Uh, I think they've been back since Tuesday uh, practicing, uh, since Tuesday night, I'm pretty sure. Um, so they've, they've got a few practices under their belt, but when you've sat out eight days from game action, um, go home for the holidays, all that sort of stuff, it, it's not a surprise that they were a little bit rusty. Um, had some early turnovers, both from Jones and from Smith, one from Edie, I think, early on, too, that just looked a little bit out of sorts. But throughout that stretch, I thought the one thing that didn't look out of sorts was defense. Um, I, I thought they played really well defensively all night. I, I honestly think that started with Lance. I thought his energy defensively was really, really good out of the gate, and especially when he came back in on that next stint, um, just was really forcing drivers and ball handlers uh, end end up traffic, uh, which led to some steals and turn or steals for some other guys that were out there on the court. Um, he got a block on a three later in the game that was really impressive. Uh, but I, I just thought defensive effort and, and rebounding goes into that, right? So, um, you know, I think we forget that sometimes that that rebounding margin is, is part of the defensive effort. And so I thought we had really good pressure from perimeter defense. 
uh, especially from Lance early on. And then I thought guys really crashed the board when, when they did miss. I also need to give a shout out to Fletcher. Um, I, I really thought he was flying out and closing out on three point shooters. Um, really not just tonight, but in the last few games, um, ever since really painter challenged him after that Alabama game, I, I think he's been a lot faster and reactive to get out to those shooters, uh, when he needs to, you know, he's probably never going to be Lance Jones defensively or Rafael Davis defensively. Right. But he can be better than what he was. And I think he has been, and I, I think he's really showed an increased effort from that standpoint throughout the last three games, especially. Yeah. The defense is where I wanted to kind of hit on first. Um, as we dive in a little bit deeper is I thought the rotations in general, just really, really good. That started with Jones up top pressuring Braden Smith was, this was the most pressure I've seen him apply probably, especially in that first half. Um, and, and just schematically, one of the things um, we, we kind of noticed during was so Eastern Kentucky was running what I call Spain pick and roll. And so what that is, is it's a normal pick and roll, but somebody is back screening the screener. Um, and so in this scenario, Edie's guy is screening the ball up top. Somebody setting a back screen for him. And what Purdue eventually did is instead of kind of allowing this advantage on as drives and things is the guy who was screening Edie's guy. So who was screening the screener that was usually Smith or like Gillis or Garter or winger or whatever. He just switched onto the ball. Whoever was on ball switched onto the big until he rolled. And then he just took whoever popped, uh, which was the guy that was setting the back screen. I know it's not the easiest to explain without a visual. I wish I had my board with me, um, but just good stuff there. Just being able to switch. It was really quick, too. Like there was the switching was on point um, and it just kind of took away a lot of their advantages. I thought like Eastern Kentucky hit a bunch of tough shots. Um, credit to them for that. I, you know, they tried posting up Blanton a bit. Lawyer did really well on Bland, not um, not giving up easy shots in the post. Um, and yeah, I, I think in general, this, you said Fletcher, I agree with that. And everybody really just most people I thought tonight were doing a really, really good job flying around. Um, and just, you have to live with your rules because at some point you're going to give up something as a defense. It's just how the game is at this point. There's too many skilled players to take away every single thing. So you live with what you, um, you know, you're going to give up something, but you have rules to get that thing in place. And I thought they did that really, really well. Um, I thought even like Colvin, I think towards the end, maybe it wasn't as good, but his first in I thought was pretty good defensively. Obviously, that's the big thing with him going forward is what can he do defensively? Just a good, probably their best defensive game, probably uh, in a minute. It's their best defensive game in a minute, in my opinion. Uh, I would have to go back and, and really go through to see when exactly I think that, but just another good game to see from them. Um, we can read through, unless you have something else on the defense, we can read through some of the stats. <laughs> Let's do it. All right, so just kind of skim through these. Um, you have, you know, Purdue winning 50, or 80 to 53. Sorry, I'm trying to. There we go. Purdue wins 80 to 53. Uh, Eastern Kentucky shoots four for 19 from three, which is 21.1%. Purdue is only six of 21 from three, um, and most of those coming from just a couple guys. Like you said, Purdue dominates boards 46 to 25. They have 20 assists on 33 makes compared to eight assists for Eastern Kentucky. Kind of goes back to the defense. Uh, 46 points in the paint for Purdue, 18 for Eastern Kentucky, 15 points off turnovers for Purdue, four for Eastern Kentucky. Um, and just in general, 11 or 11 turnovers for Purdue after what, five or six in the first six minutes, it felt like. Um, and then yeah. 12 for Eastern Kentucky. So they got that under control. Anything aside from the rebounds, maybe that stands out to you from, from the stat sheet? Um, points off turnovers. Uh, again, I, I just, I, I love when we see that in double digits. Um, and it's something that I, I just didn't feel like was part of Purdue's game plan or not game plan necessarily. I just don't necessarily know that they had the personnel to consistently do it last year. Um, but 15 points off turnovers tonight. They, I think we only finished with, uh, in the end, uh, I think we were, uh, up by two on turnover margin, but they only had like four points off turnovers and we have 15 points that we scored off turnovers. So I just yeah. love when, when we take advantage and get out and actually use that turnover, reward, reward the person who got the steal, get out and run, score some easy buckets. It just makes it so much easier, um, especially if you're a little bit bogged down and struggling a little bit in the half-court offense. Um, being able to get out and, and just create easy buckets, I, I, I just love when this team does that. Um, I think that starts with, with Braden and Lance both being able to push it if they get the ball quickly. 
Um, we saw one, I don't even know if it would have been considered fast break points, but it was like a, a secondary break where Lance pushed the ball up, got to the top of the key. He kicks it to Lawyer on the wing. We, he kicks it to Smith in the corner, and then Smith fires it down to TKR underneath the basket, and he gets an and one. Um, one of the prettier, like, all team involved kind of ball movement plays of the night but just the ability to push and, and score quick i think is different with this team than what it was from last year's team and then when you've got camden heidi flying all over the place um that's nice and i realize morton's coming in off the bench quicker than he is now uh it was different earlier in the season and i don't know how much we're gonna see you know it seems like every other game we get one of those camden like back cuts uh, to the rim or something like that but Got to see two of those tonight and just beautiful alley-oop passes um, from a couple of different guys. Um, without a doubt, those are going to be impressive and are going to continue to be crowd pleasers. When he gets a little bit more comfortable cutting um, to the rim on the break, I can't wait to see those when we get out in fast break uh, where, he, where he gets those alley-oops uh, for, for big-time, big-time crowd-pleasing dunks as well. Yeah, I think part of it, too, is just – Braden, I, the one lob was Braden in the transition. Like, Braden just does such a good job of knowing. Like, I really think he knows while he's crossing half court of where he kind of wants to go. Um, you can just see him kind of, he's done it with, he's done it with, he did it with Edie today. He's done it before, I know for sure with Edie. Uh, he's done it with, I've seen him do it with Lawyer where he just picks up Lawyer's guy. Like, he just takes whatever guy he wants. He's like, okay, I'm going to get this guy open. So let me just dribble at, you know, wherever I need to be. Um, gets Heidi on the lob here. And then the second lob, uh, that was a really good zone set which I think is something we should at least touch on is Purdue handled the zone well. Uh, it was a really good zone set. Basically, they just kind of had a bunch of cutters cut through the middle, cut up to the top of the key and spaced everything out, and it just shifted Eastern Kentucky's zone way up. Um, and now Heidi has that backdoor cut from the uh, weak side corner. It's an easy lob. Uh, but, yeah, I think, you know, let me see. What's the exact number? Yeah, Purdue with seven steals. So 12 turnovers for Eastern Kentucky and seven of them were live ball. That is gonna That's going to be a big thing of – because there's a there is a big difference between live and non-live ball turnovers. You know, non-live, yeah. they're not obviously they're not good, but you can set up your defense and all that. Uh, live ball turnovers, that's where you you got to be able to make them pay. And I think Purdue is much much better at it this year than last season of just being able to get on run. You have Brayden, you have Jones, um, who can who can really push the ball. Lawyer can if he has you know good numbers or whatever. Um, but yeah, just I, I think that was also a good thing um, <coughs> in terms of just like breakdown from the game. I don't have a ton to be a hundred percent honest. Um, I'll talk about the zone because I thought they handled it really, really well. I think they did a much better job of getting the ball in the middle of this game, uh, getting it, you know, flashing high posts and kind of working from there. TKR, I think had a couple against it. ED got a little couple buckets. Um, just good thing to see. Obviously, as we know, the Arizona game happened, um, but as I don't know who's, you know, Maryland is a team that Maryland is a team that will zone. Like they're Maryland will um, kind of similar to Eastern Kentucky. They'll show up some, that's somewhat of a press drop into a two, three zone. And that's something Purdue's going to have to handle as they head out uh, to Maryland for Tuesday's game. But I don't know if you have anything to add on the zone. I just wanted to mention that, Hey, they, they looked pretty good against it. Yeah, no, I, I thought they looked good against it. Um, I thought they worked into that high post a couple of times and then kind of pushed the ball out from there. Gillis hit a nice little 18 footer later in the game. I don't remember if that was against the zone. I think it was. Um, where he just turned and faced. What's that? Yeah, I said I think it was. Yeah. Um, you know, I always <laughs> – I realize that's kind of an old-school thing, but, like, I, I always love seeing that ball kind of go to the free throw line in a zone and so that it kind of collapses in a little bit and then forces uh, – or gives him the ability to turn and, like, look and either face and shoot or kick out to open shooters uh, depending on where the zone moves from there. Um, so love seeing Gillis turn and hit that. Um, he was active uh, really – Hit those couple of threes, but hit that one as well. But he was active trying to dribble to the rim a couple of times, too. I think he got fouled on one of those at, at some point in there. I think, too, you know, we got to say something about Fletcher. Um, he came out yeah. hot real quick. Um, ends up 6 of 11 and 2 from 4 from 3, but but was really on early on. And it just um, continues to amaze me. And, like, he his drive is not off his athletic ability, right? Like... Like he is not getting past anybody because he has the the quickest first step, or because um, he's extremely athletic and is gonna rise up over people. But people respect him uh, because of his three point shooting ability so much that if he just shows a little head fake, he doesn't really even have to give a shot fake on a lot of those. He's just kind of bobbing his head up, and they're committing so hard to the three point line 
even if that first step's kind of slow, he's still going to get by. And once he gets by, he's so good at putting up a ball from four or five feet out from different angles, um, or, or if he's shooting it straight baseline, just shooting a little floater. And so good at ju uh, ju about just putting some touch on that and hitting the backboard in the right spot to put that in and doing it through contact a lot of times. He really didn't take much contact tonight. Um, but, I mean, in some of those big games, he's, he's doing it through contact too. And it just continues to amaze me. You know, I, I think outside of Purdue, the people who watch Purdue every week know that Fletcher Lawyer is more than a three-point shooter. But I think the national narrative is Fletcher Lawyer, their three-point shooter. And, and he's so much more than that. But it all starts – because of his ability to hit the three. And when he hits a couple early, then they respect it and really fly out on him. And then he can get into his whole bag in terms of what he can do offensively. Yeah. It's something I've kind of harped on. It's like, Hey, lawyer can just kind of get to the rim and um, Smith and Jones are obviously much better and they provide at the guard spot now, but it's, you can't fully play lawyer as a shooter because he will get to the low floater or somehow hit four dudes and throw something up and it just goes in because that's just what he's doing. Uh, I wanted something I did want to mention with Fletcher lawyer, right? Is we all know last year, the shooting struggles he had. Um, and I think the consensus thought is he started out hot and then cooled off. Um, and I was, I, I mean, I did my breakdown of him over the summer. Um, he had a really good no early November or good November and a good January. But at this point in the season last year, he was only shooting 31.7% from three. He's up right now. He's at 39.3% from three. Um, and that he's even, you know, he struggled a little bit. Obviously, I think he is a little bit of a streaky shooter. And so not saying maybe he sustains the 40%, but he's shooting much better from both two and three. Uh, his two point percentage is up from 41 to 46% this year. Um, part of that, I think, is just absorbing a little bit more contact, uh, having a full year under his belt. They hit the freshman wall. We obviously do have to see that last year if they're able to sustain for all you know, 35, hopefully, plus games. But just wanted to mention that because he is shooting the ball much, much better this year. Um, he is – let's see. He is – it went away. Man, that's crazy. He's like fifth on three-point percentage on this team. That's nuts. Uh, Lawyer? Gillis is leading at 51 – yeah. Gillis is leading at 51.9%. Obviously, this is all different volumes. Um, but if we take away volumes, Gillis is 51%, Smith's 47%, TKR is 42%, um, and then it's Lawyer at 39%, Colvin 38.9%. Oh, no, Heidi's 42. Point no, that's great. Okay. My point stands. <laughs> he's, still, he's shooting the ball really, really well. Hey, and everybody is on Purdue. They are down to 20th in three-point percentage on, in the country, which makes me honestly feel a little better because I was – I've just kind of been waiting for the shoe to drop on the three-point percentage at some point and just like – Hey, no, this is a team that just was streaky at the right time. Um, I think they are much better than that because there are what? How many? There's out of the ten guys that play legit minutes. How many do you trust to shoot the ball from three? Seven, right now? Six, seven? Um, eight. Six, six, right? Eight. Everybody beside? Oh no, no, seven, seven. So this is yeah. right. I don't want to name the three I don't trust, but yeah, definitely seven. And six, it's it's six and a half too because uh, Jones, you're gonna get amazing stuff, and sometimes <laughs> you just not. Um, you, Mad says, goes. Do you guys remember Jihad Proctor? I do know that was your guy. Mad says, I do remember him. He was uh he was solid for you know really good in non conference. I think struggled a little bit in conference play. Um, we're about 24 minutes into this. If you guys are watching, please hit the subscribe button. If you're on YouTube, uh, if you're watching on Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever. Um, Please, you know, like. I don't know if there's like on Twitter. If there's, if you're watching on Twitter, then comment uh, something. I don't know what. Uh, well, maybe we'll get something. We'll get something to actually comment about next game. Uh, we do appreciate everybody tuning in, though. Like I said, like, subscribe. We're on audio for post game stuff, um, which I will make sure goes up immediately after interviews going forward. <laughs> even if I am not on the podcast. Craig, do you have much else for this game um, specifically? I know it's it's a buy game. No. Last two things I would hit on really quick. We we really didn't talk about, like, Smith again deferred. And, and we see him do this in a lot of games where it's like, I don't need to score, so I'm going to get everybody else involved. And, and I actually love that in games like this because you're trying to get other guys going. You're trying to get Heidi some confidence. You're trying to get Colvin some confidence, even though he missed quite a few tonight. Um, you know, you're, you're trying to work other people into that and get them some confidence as we get into the games that matter a little bit more. But he had eight assists, right? <laughs> like, 
I don't know how many total minutes he played tonight. It couldn't have been more than 20, 25 maybe, um, but but had eight assists. And a lot of them came in a really short amount of time in the, in the second half. 24 minutes. 24 minutes, right? Um, so quite a bit lower than what his normal minutes would be. And then the last thing I would say too, um, somebody said it in the comments earlier. I don't know if I can find it right now, but there were a couple different people who said that they really love the fact that um, – Lance put his head down and got to the rim and you, you touched on it. Like he, he figured out the first time he drove of like, Oh, I'm the bigger body. I'm more athletic than anybody they got. I can get to the rim whenever I want. And he took that first three and he missed it. And we've seen him miss a three badly plenty of times where he keeps shooting and he's going to have to keep shooting threes in some games. But this game, he figured out that he could pretty much just put the ball down, uh, put his head down and get to the rim when he wanted to. Drew a few fouls doing that, and I think he finishes four or five from the field. Only misses one field goal, if I'm pretty sure, and all four of those were layups or uh, mid-range shots where he attacked the basket. So I, I love to see that. You know, I, I think we've talked about this ad nauseum, but his defensive ability, his secondary ball handler skills, and his ability to put his head down and get to the rim, I think are the most important things that Lance brings to this team and, and love that he just kind of recognized the game was sloppy a little bit early on, like, hey – let me go bully ball a little bit and get to the rim, get some points, make sure we extend this lead so it doesn't get nervous at all in the first half whatsoever. Yeah. I uh, hit it on Brayden real quick. He he was yeah, he, he was just toying with the defense. He threw what a behind the back pass in transition to Edie, threw a lob, threw, I believe, two between the leg passes on the rolls to Edie, um, which one of them worked. I think the Edie got a foul or whatever, but yeah, he was just he, this game did not matter to most of these guys out there. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It was just like, uh, hey, yeah, we're we're way better than them. We're just going to go out there, get some cardio in, get back into game speed, and, and get ready for Big Ten play. Um, last thing before we – or I guess two more things before we move on to um, a little bit of a Big Ten preview. Here is the rotation chart for anybody that is watching. If you're on audio, it's just you know the rotation chart, um, highlighting where guys played, how many minutes, stuff. Um, nothing really stood out to me, I think, especially in a game like this. Uh you, you know, this is you mentioned Ethan Warren coming off the bench first um, instead of instead of Gillis or not instead of Gillis instead of Heidi. Uh, he did share he does share the floor though with Heidi. Warren's kind of the guy that can he's just kind of the guy that'll do whatever. Um, and it's just it's worked out pretty well because of his defense and, and things like that. Does anything stand out to you here? I mean, Smith nobody plays more than what twenty six minutes, and you get some bench guys in it towards late. I don't know if anything stands out to me, but Craig, you? No, no, not really, not really. But before we move on to Big Ten preview, we are now 45 minutes. 45 yeah. minutes now outside the game. And there's got to be at least 500 people here yeah. still, something like that, or or more. Uh, Zach and Lance are still firing away, signing autographs out there. Um, so their night is a long way from being over yet if they're going to stay here until everybody gets satisfied uh, with getting an autograph on the night. Yeah, usually these shows, um, I'm like one of the last to leave the arena, and uh, that's just not going to happen today. It's just as long as we do like an hour and a half show, which we are not planning on doing. Um, there was one comment. Uh, this is not really big t ten adjacent. Well, it's kind of an in between. Um, JP says, Joe and Craig, do you think Painter should place more value in his defensive scheme on forcing turnovers? It really doesn't seem like something he's particularly interested in. Um, for me, because like they're still just really good, I don't think you place an emphasis, especially with what Edie does at the rim. And I know because Edie is so good in the paint, you don't want him being the one that has to rotate on the perimeter. And I think Painter just wants to stay out of rotation. I think he said it before. He just wants to stay out of defensive rotations as much as possible. Um, sometimes it just has to happen. I think allowing Jones and Smith to pressure the ball kind of like they do um, – that's one way to kind of get turnovers, and I think he's allowing them to do that. A lot, aside from that, it's more just relying on – like Smith kind of intercepted a couple passes today or read a couple. But aside from that, I don't think it's like full on, you know, we need to force turnovers to win. I, I think for Painter, it's stick to your principles. You have the you know one of the best defensive anchors in the entire country in ED down low. You have some solid – you have a solid perimeter defender for Sharon Jones. Um, Smith and Lawyer kind of do their jobs, and they're in the right spot more more often than not. Uh, so my that's my take is is you kind of just let them happen organically, and if you get them, you get them. 
And I and I do think we'd have to go back and look at last year compared to this year, but I, I would bet our steel numbers are up quite a bit from last year to this year. And I think a lot of that comes from having guys, a couple of guys that have the ability to pressure the ball. Because if you if you pay attention, a lot of a lot of those steals, most of those steals come off of a secondary defender that's kind of crashing down and swiping in. So somebody else is creating that on ball pressure and that's distracting the guy. It's making him go out wider than he wants to go out or whatever. And then Fletcher can swipe down or Braden can swipe down or whatever it is and get that steal and take off. So it's not always just the guy who's actually getting the steal um, that's creating that turnover. It's somebody else also creating on ball pressure. So I, I think we've added an element of that this year where we're, we're seeing that happen more. And definitely once we do get those live ball turnovers, uh, certainly scoring more efficiently off of those as well. Yep. Um, or we can hit on Jeff Park's question too, and then that kind of leads us into Big Ten play. Jeff Park goes, with the non-conference over, does Purdue change anything about how they've been playing? Do they start pounding the post in Big Ten play? Um, the funny thing with pounding the post, and I can pull up the numbers really quick to confirm, but I believe they still have more post-ups than anybody else in the entire country per game. Um, it's just isn't as much as they did last year. Uh, I don't think they change how they play, especially with like, well, I don't know. Because I was going to say they aren't going to because there aren't like insanely dominant bigs in the Big Ten this year. But at the same time, is that like, could that be a reason they try to even go to ED more? Um, my initial thought is they're just going to play the way they've been playing because it works. Yeah, they are. They have the most post-ups in the country. They're also one of the most efficient post-up uh, teams in the entire country. So, I don't think they do. I, I think it's been working. It's worked against really good teams in non-conference. Um, and, and the Big Ten is just different this year because it isn't as high level. And I don't think there are as many, like, um, in you know, there aren't as many, like, super, really any superstar bigs. The second best big is Amori, who's more of a really good defensive player. And then it's, what, Cricky? It's Reese? Like, I'm sure there's some guys I'm leaving out that, oh, Kalo Ware probably. Um, but like I said, just not as many bit dominant big guys. I, I think they stick with how they play. Yeah, I, for the most part. And, and I, I think we've seen uh, this team be able to play several different ways. Um, I think there's been a couple of games where they've really pushed the ball quite a bit more and got out in transition a little bit more, been able to play a tempo game. Um, thinking about Alabama there, we've seen some games where if they're really collapsing down on Zach, like in the first half tonight, Zach's just going to kick that out or they're going to work it around. They're going to be able to put up threes. Uh, we got, like you said, Fletcher Lawyer at 39% or whatever is the fifth best shooter on the team currently. Um, or they can just feed Zach all night. And they did that the first five minutes, four minutes of the second half tonight. Um, we've seen that often where a team is going to try to do something specifically to take Zach away. And Zach kind of shares the ball well. They make the right decisions in the first half. Other people get involved. And then the second half, Zach suddenly puts up like 15 to 20 points in a seven or eight minute stretch. Um, so I, I just think they're going to, I don't think they're going to force anything. I, I think they're just going to take yeah. whatever the defense is giving them on that day. Um, obviously, where you start to question that is, all right, if the three point shooting isn't on that day, um, or maybe some other things aren't working, then then what do they do to try to change things schematically to, to get something to work? Um, and if they got to kind of force something to happen, uh, do they force it a little bit more to Zach in, in those instances? But, you know, we, I guess we saw that a little bit at Northwestern uh, where some things weren't working for this team. Not everybody was clicking on all cylinders. And I think they fell back into that trap a little bit. I don't like the idea of force feeding the post because to me, that's what happened late in the Northwestern game. Um, guys weren't confident in their shot. Guys weren't confident to try to take it um, and, and get a drive to the rim. And in those cases, uh, I thought they over forced things to Zach at times and, and that led to some turnovers. Um, just take what's there and have the, have the Lance Jones goldfish mindset that if I've missed my first five, three pointers, I'm still going to hit my sixth. Uh, yep. we've seen that, we've seen that pay off <laughs> in a, the Arizona game, right? Uh, yep. guys got to be confident and guys got to keep shooting because they're good shooters. Yeah. Um, we talk for about big 10 for a few minutes and then get out of here. The big 10 is just not that good this year. It really isn't. Um, I would say obviously there's the Terrence Shannon news with Illinois, um, and just kind of see how that all plays out. 
Um, but with with Shannon not on the team, and obviously, in obviously in the, in you know the, the what's going on with that, basketball is not the most important thing in that situation. But when you do look at the basketball impact, like that drops Illinois a ton. They were kind of looking like pretty, um, you know, they were definitely a top three team pretty easily, uh, and then most considered a top two team in the Big Ten. So now you really got Wisconsin and Ohio State as the only two teams that you most people probably fully believe in. I think we believe in Michigan are starting to believe in Michigan State more, or at least fine with throwing them maybe not in the Wisconsin Ohio State tier, but like kind of being like okay, they're they're at least going to be solid. Um, and then you get through the rest, it's like Nebraska could be good, but they haven't. Re- they've only played a couple bit important games. Um, Michigan just lost to what McNeese or whatever. Yeah, McNeese, McNeese State. State. Today. Um, you just kind of go up and down, and, and nobody really looks good. I mean, when you go on Kempom, Kempom ratings, uh, Purdue's two, Illinois is nine. We, at some point, assuming Illinois doesn't keep playing this way, that'll drop. Uh, Wisconsin's fourteen, MSU's twenty-two, Ohio State's twenty-seven, and then it's what? Like basically nobody else is in the top fifty. Um, this is a league that there's a scenario where this league only has like five bids. I don't know if that'll happen, but there is a scenario. Um, I guess quickly for you, overall Big Ten thoughts, and then we'll hit on Maryland a little bit and then get out of here. Well, yeah, and, and again, uh, like you said, that's that situation is um, it, it's a it's a bigger than basketball situation without yeah. a doubt. If you 100%. guys if you guys want to hear a good discussion of that, um, our friends over at Sleepers Media, Greg Waddell and Carter Elliott, put up a video yesterday that I think I, I think they handled that topic really really well. Um, and they kind of looked at, at different things surrounding that would encourage you to go watch that. I'm not going to delve into that any further. Um, with that said, I, I think big 10 at large now, Ohio state and Wisconsin, um, at Wisconsin always scares me. I've been there the last two years. Um, both games were extremely close, a bank three pointer helped Wisconsin pull it out the two it's years ago. Cool. And then per, 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 yeah, Purdue pulled it out last year. Um, but Wisconsin's got a way of just grinding and working, and and I think that team's better than last year. Um, what's is the new guy's name? Montgomery, the freshman, is that it? Blackwell, Blackwell, Blackwell. right? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I like every year I develop a big like other Big Ten team, somebody crush, and like that's my crush this year so far is him. Uh, just love watching him play and his confidence and what he can do at so many different levels, and especially defensively on the perimeter. Um, so Wisconsin worries me, obviously, in terms of a contender. Um, Ohio State, I think, has put some things together and has looked really good. I, I think Thornton, uh, Bruce Thornton has been the Thornton that I thought he would be in, in this last seven or eight game stretch uh, coming into the season. So I think really those are the two contenders. I, I still, quite frankly, think Purdue probably wins the Big Ten by four games. Um, I, I just don't see how anybody stays close. Other than the fact that the rest of the Big Ten may be so bad that Wisconsin and Ohio State clip off um, yeah. a bunch of wins easily, uh, but with the Illinois situation being what it what it is, you know they they could fall to a fifth or sixth place team uh, in the Big Ten. I do think Michigan State has found their groove a little bit. They do have a little. I forget who they play tomorrow, but I, when I was Indiana looking at State, yes, and that will be a really interesting game because. And Michigan State's big man situation is not good. And Indiana yeah. State's big man is like a baby Jokic. Um, I, I love his game. So I'm really excited to watch that Indiana State, Michigan State game, actually. Yeah. But I do think they're starting to they're starting to shoot the ball. I, like that team is gonna live or die with if they're shooting the three well and Aikens and and Hogart are playing better and Tyson Walker's finally shooting the ball better too. So I still think those three are the next three, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Michigan State. And then I think it's going to be really close beyond that. I think you look at Illinois. I think Indiana is better than we thought they were coming into the season, um, especially if they get Xavier Johnson back. I think Nebraska has looked really good. Minnesota has – I realize Minnesota still hasn't, like, played anybody, but they've looked way better. They uh, look, than they are any, so much better than last year. The, the eye test tells you that Minnesota could – clip just about any team in this league on any given night other than maybe Purdue to me just because Zach has the ability to dominate them in that game but if we transition and look specifically at Maryland I think that game's interesting Um, obviously we lost at Maryland last year 
they're going to be really good at, at applying on ball pressure. They always are. Um, that I continually go back to this, like no big man matchup is going to affect Zach Eady in a major way. There is no big man in the country that I say, Oh no, um, this big man has a chance to shut Zach down. Um, the teams that make it really difficult on Zach are the teams that make it hard for him to get the ball or that can turn him over once he gets the ball before he makes his move. I think Maryland is one of those teams just stylistically and in terms of the athleticism that they have and the on-ball pressure that they have that can do those sort of things. Um, with that said, they are like the worst three-point shooting team in the entire country or close to it. They're like in the 350s or something like that. Just they started like shooting off. a little bit better, but yeah. They're, so they're not like, dead last, but they're close to it. They are so bad offensively. And, and I really thought Reese would take a jump this year and, and be like a, a premier big man, not just in the Big Ten, but I, I really thought he might be one of the top big men in the entire country, like a top 10, top 15 center in the entire country or big man in the entire country. And he just hasn't made that jump. So I, e even if this is a slugfest for Purdue, and the offense is bogged down a little bit. I just don't see a way Maryland can score enough against Purdue with the way Purdue is playing defense and the fact that Zach is going to shut down Reese for the most part. And then if they can't hit threes, I have no idea. I Even if, if they hold Purdue to 70 points, I could see Purdue holding them to like 45. <laughs> and it'd be like a 70 to 50 point type win or something like that. Yeah. Uh I think this game worries me purely because Maryland is a team that can force turnovers. Um, they're 39th in opponent turnover rate. They are also a very big or very, they're a very wing heavy team, right? And so aside from Jameer Young, who's, you know, he's one of the best point guards in the Big Ten, um, it's 6 5. What their starting lineup is Sean Harris Smith, 6 5. Jordan Geronimo, everybody that remembers him from IU, he's more of a power forward, but he starts at the three. He's a 6'6 six, six athletic dude. Dante Scott, 6'8. Julian Reese is 6'9. Um, off the bench, Jahari Long, 6'5. Jamie Kaiser, 6'6. Six, six. Matty Trey, or 6'11. Uh, like, they just got a lot of length. And so, if that can force turnover, like Purdue, Purdue has to handle the ball. For me, the most important player of this game is going to be Brain Smith. Um, I think Edie's going to do his thing. You We'll obviously want some some shooting from you know guys like Jones, Lawyer, and all that, and it is the uh, the Under Armour ball or whatever. Not the Under Armour ball. The uh, what's the ball that everybody hit? Wilson. Wilson. The Wilson, Wilson Evo. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it we is that shot, ball. We shot. We broke the curse true. at Ari true, true. playing Arizona. We broke the curse. Um, but Braden's going to one have to control the ball. Like he's just going to have to take care of it, and then two like. When they get to their pick and roll, Julian Reese plays a very deep drop coverage. Um, and maybe they'll step him up a little bit more, but with Edie rolling, I can't imagine that. It's so bright. It's going to be a lot of Braden just getting to his pull up. Like, I think I'm not holding these past two games against Braden because they were the game, you know, it was Jacksonville and Eastern Kentucky. But if Braden is looking to be that passive tonight or Maryland, I don't think that'll be good for them. I think he's going to have to hunt his shot. I think he'll get a lot of good looks and good looking opportunities. Um, so he's the most important. Obviously, like defense, you just right as of right now, you just have to control Jameer Young. Uh, he put up thirty-seven or something like that against UCLA just a, like a week ago. Um, he's put up twenty in like eight of his or seven of his last nine games. Uh, he is their offense right now. Sean Hare Smith is not showing out as much as anybody really hoped. Uh, a lot of other guys are just struggling to shoot the ball from three. Like Jam you know, Jameer Young's thirty-five percent. Dante Scott's 33%, and then they're, everybody else is in the 20s or lower. Um, I'm interested to see what the matchups are. Like I said, I assume like I assume Lance Jones has to take Jameer Young. So then that leaves Brayden Smith on Deshaun Harris-Smith, a 6'5 wing that likes to get downhill. And then that leaves Fletch on Jordan Geronimo, a 6'6 basically power forward that can jump out the gym. Um, so controlling the glass. Uh, it's a game that worries me purely because I think it's just – it just feels like one of those games that Maryland somehow keeps close. I think Purdue is much more talented, and they should ultimately win. But I don't think it is going to be as easy a game as, as maybe some think. Um, I know I just rambled a ton there. Uh, what else do you got on this game, or, or any, do you want to kind of wrap this up? I think you're wrong. <laughs> Fair. I hope I, I am. I, I I, I just I, I I don't see the way Maryland scores enough points. Um, I think Lance makes life hard on Jameer Young. Um, I'm not going to say that they win easily, 
uh, but I see it being a 15 point type win in the end. Personally, I, I think they're going to go to Maryland angry about last year uh, losing out there. And I think Smith is going to show out. I think having a secondary ball handler is going to help a bunch. And true. I think Zach that is dominates. true. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so that is Tuesday, 7 o'clock. I believe it's Peacock. Yep, 7 Eastern, Peacock at Maryland. We will be live right after the game. Um, that will be basically two or three minutes after the final buzzer sounds. I believe it will be all three of yep. us. I'm not going to fully speak for Braggs, but I believe he will be on as well. Um, and we're in, we're in the thick of it. It's it's Maryland Tuesday. It's Illinois Friday. It's, it's Big Ten play. Um, it is here. I'm excited, even if the Big Ten isn't as good. Um, somebody mentioned that the Big Ten is second in Kempom, and that's just like I said, it's because the bottom of the league is like not bad. Everybody's just kind of decent for the most part. Like Penn State, like not bad is I'm um, comparing it to like like there's no Minnesota of last year, right? Like nobody, even Penn, Penn State's going to be feisty at least. They're not yeah, going to win. No, feisty. I I agree. My look was more, but a lot of other conferences have looked bad too. Like, True. like I think I think that's, that's part bad. of, I think that's part of the Big Ten being second in, in Ken Palm ratings is when you really start looking around. Like I mean, the Pac-12 has looked terrible. Um, you know, really the Big Twelve is the only conference that has primarily looked good all the way through the non-conference. Um, even the Big East, Big East has had some really bad losses um, as well. So you know, I I think the Big Ten is down from last year. Um, but at the same time, I don't know relative to the national scope that they're we, we should talk about the Big Ten like they are, you know, really down there in terms of the level of play regarding other conferences as well outside of the Big 12, personally. Yep. Uh, T.D. Ransfer says Ransfer says MD, Maryland has a 19 game home win streak. This will be a um, break game. So I have no, literally no clue what the crowd's going to be. It could be a leap because Purdue's number one in the country. It could be a break game and, and you knock it as much, but they that is true. They have not lost at home. Um, like I said, we'll be live right after. Uh, Craig thinks it'll be probably a little bit further out than what I, th- I think it'll be a little bit of a closer game. Um, you know, kind of that game where it's like Purdue is the better team, but you can never be like, okay, Purdue won. You know, it, it's one of those just like, ah, Maryland does enough to stick around and, uh, but Purdue ultimately wins. Um, yeah, you got anything else in this game, or are we good to go? This game, big time. I, game. I'm I'm good to go. Just uh, la- last update. There's probably still about 200 fans here waiting for autographs. Zach and Lance are still doing it. I, I don't know that any transfer has ever loved being a Purdue Boilermaker or loved Purdue as much as Lance has loved it and just soaked it all up. Um, he, he knows Zach's got a huge line out here and he's kind of going around to the areas that, that Zach's not in, uh, providing the fans with some, ex, uh, an experience getting to interact with a player and signing autographs and taking, climbing up in the stands and taking selfies with them and everything else. Um, love, love the joy that he has about just being part of this program. And Zach's got about hundred people over there standing around him still trying to get autographs. Yep. Uh, it's just what they do here. I'm, Lance Jones is very, very happy to be a Boilermaker. I think we as fans, uh, maybe we were a little bit skeptical at first, I'm, you know, in the offseason, but after we kind of watched the first couple of games, that we are all very, very, very glad that he is, in fact, a Boilermaker. Uh, that'll do it for this postgame show. If you're still watching, please like, subscribe. It just helps us out so much. We'll be live Tuesday um, after Maryland, pretty much right after the buzzer ends. We'll be live, all three of us, presumably. Uh, we are on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts as well. If you prefer, to listen to these on audio we have um you know, craig and braggs were uh, interviewing we had bobby buckets on uh, the play by play or was he the radio color analyst or whatever for purdue basketball former player uh, definitely go listen to that on audio if you're traveling or whatever uh, follow us on twitter at boilers and stands you can follow craig on twitter at craig bowers 34 and you can follow me on twitter at joe jackson cbb once again we appreciate everybody tuning in we'll be live tuesday maryland nine o'clock roughly eastern time after the game appreciate everybody tuning in and we will catch you in the next one